you look at the life sciences today and try to figure out where is the greatest excitement in biological research, whether in medicine or in the life sciences more broadly, it's clearly in genetics and genomics. If you look at where major funding agencies are investing their money, if you look at what health journalists are writing about, everyone writes as though we are in the century of, the century of the gene. The 20th century was the century of physics. The 21st century, people say, will be the century of genomics. So one question that comes up for historian of medicine uh, is why has this happened and how likely is it that genetic science will have the huge payoff that everyone wants it to have? And the easiest way to illustrate this is with a common disease, something like obesity. Now, if you talk to geneticists, they will say of all the human traits, obesity is one of the ones under tightest genetic control. Height probably is the most genetically determined disease, and after height, it's likely obesity that they think genes are the most relevant for. And that is well and good, and it may be true from a genetic point of view. But from a historical point of view, there's a real puzzle there. In the United States and in most other countries worldwide, the prevalence of obesity is increasing rapidly. Over the past 30 years, the prevalence of obesity has doubled in the United States. Now, there might be some people who would say, well, then if it's doubled, there must be some kind of genetic change in the population. But most observers think that is hugely unlikely. The increase in prevalence of obesity has much more to do with the structure of society whether it's the physical structure of whether we have cities where people walk or drive, or the food environment, which influence the choices that people make in that. And these are the sorts of things responsible for the rise of obesity. Now, you can go through a whole series of cases, the rise of diabetes, the rise and fall of heart disease in Europe and North America. There are many, many diseases out there that are powerfully influenced both by genetics, but also by these social factors. And the question that comes up from the point of view of both science policy and health policy is given the range of factors that influence these diseases, where should we be investing our resources now? If you really want to understand obesity or diabetes, is the solution going to come from these massive multi-million dollar investments in gene sequencing, trying to understand the genetics of these diseases? Or could you get much more return on your investment by hiring a bunch of anthropologists or sociologists or others to study what is actually accounting for the changing rates of these diseases over short time frames, the kinds of time frames that probably are not involved, that probably do not involve genetic change. And so if you want to understand a disease, what's the best solution? Is it genetics or is it something else? I think there's a very interesting question there. The same question comes up in the question of health policy. Suppose you're concerned about the rise of obesity or diabetes in a society, and you're trying to figure out what to do about it. What the geneticists will say in order to justify the investment in genetics is that, look, yes, we'll admit that obesity has increased for non-genetic reasons. But by studying the genetics of disease, we can understand the molecular pathways that are causing the disease. And if we can identify new genetic and molecular pathways, we can develop, we can identify targets for dr drug intervention, and then we can develop new drugs that perhaps will allow us to produce a pharmaceutical solution for problems like obesity. Now that would certainly be well and good. If you could develop a drug that pa patients or people, not even just patients, that anyone could take that would treat obesity, that would be a blockbuster that would transform society in a positive way. But the question there is, why is that model so appealing, given that essentially we know everything we need to know to prevent obesity? If you want to prevent obesity, it's not rocket science. It's a question of how much energy people are consuming versus how much energy people are expending. Now, obviously, willpower figure, figures into this. The kinds of choices that people have available to them figures into this. But the fundamental question of obesity, regardless of genetics, is one of supply and demand. If you want to lose weight, exercise more, eat less, you will lose weight. Now, for some people that's harder or easier to do because of their genetic factors, but the fundamental truth is there. If there's not enough food, people get thin. If people exercise a lot, they get thin. So what should we be doing as a society? Should we be investing massive resources to develop drugs that will allow people to remain thin despite eating whatever they want and exercising as little as they want? Or should we instead be investing resources in trying to restructure society itself, restructuring the urban infrastructure, 
restructuring the food environment such that it's easier for people to make the kinds of decisions that will lead to healthy lives that don't require pharmaceutical intervention. I don't know what the right answer to that question is. My main concern is that that question isn't even receiving the serious discussion it deserves because people have invested so much of their hope and their resources in trying in pursuit of the genetic explanations and genetic solutions to what's fundamentally a social and environmental problem. Looking ahead at what to expect over the next century, I think it's inevitable that life sciences will continue to invest heavily in pursuit of genomics. And I don't think this is necessarily a problem. It would be incredibly useful if genomics and genomic science produces the kinds of discoveries that geneticists are hoping for. If we could really understand at a level of genes and molecular pathways what's going on with disease, that would be really, really valuable. The question that comes up for me is one of opportunity costs. If we focus exclusively on these things, ex looking forward to a future time when these kinds of solutions exist, what opportunities have we missed for intervening now with the knowledge that we have now that could make a real difference for people now and in the future? And so what I would say is that it's fine for society to invest in the pursuit, uh, sorry, it is fine for society to invest resources in pursuit of better genetic science and better genetic solutions. But that kind of investment can't be done at the expense of other kinds of interventions that would work here and would work now, that would focus people's attentions on what we know and how to get the best return on what we know. There are many problems facing American societies and world societies more generally where the problem isn't that we lack answers. The problem is that we lack the willpower to put those answers into practice. Probably the best example of that is smoking. It's been well known now for 50 years that smoking causes cancer, that smoking causes heart disease, that smoking is probably the single leading cause of premature mortality on this planet. There's really no scientific dispute about that. And yet, in the United States, roughly 20% of the population continues to smoke. And in most other countries worldwide, it's far higher than that. So you have this problem, a huge burden of tobacco-related mortality. What's the solution? You can do genetic research to try to figure out why some smokers get lung cancer, but most smokers do not. And you can do genetic research to figure out the risks for emphysema or bronchitis, or the risk factors for heart disease. So you could say, well, okay, for the people who smoke, these are the smokers who are most at risk of those things, so let's give them special drugs. You could do that, but you could also figure out why is it that 20% of Americans and more people elsewhere continue to smoke, and you could implement a whole series of social policies to make it harder for that to happen. Now, it turns out there's some very simple things you could do. A few years ago, when I was living in a town, Needham, Massachusetts, the town decided on its own, this wasn't a question of state policy or federal policy, this was a question of town policy, to raise the age limit for when you can buy cigarettes from age 18, which is the standard in the United States, up to age 21. When they looked at teenage smokers and tried to figure out who was providing cigarettes to these teenage smokers, it wasn't their parents, it wasn't adults, they were mostly getting them from kids age 18 to 21. So it was the people just slightly older than they were who were providing cigarettes to all these underage smokers. So the leaders of this town had the obvious idea. If you make it harder for the 18 to 20 and the 21 year olds to get cigarettes, that's gonna make it much, much harder for the 12, 13 and 14 year olds to get cigarettes. So they implemented this policy change and sure enough, smoking rates amongst children under age 18 were cut in half in a year. A hugely impressive response to a very simple and relatively uncontroversial piece of public policy. Now, some people thought this wasn't fair. If you're 18 in this country, you're allowed to drive, you're allowed to vote, shouldn't you be allowed to smoke? It's an interesting question. If giving 18-year-olds access to smoking is leading to more smoking among 16-year-olds, that's a real problem. You could say that you know 18-year-olds have failed on their responsibility. If 18-year-olds if had smoked and hadn't sold cigarettes to 16-year-olds, that would have been okay. But that's not what was happening. 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds were buying cigarettes, selling them to underage smokers, and that's a problem. And so sometimes we know what we need to know to make a huge impact on health policy. The question is, are we willing to make the hard political choices to implement those policies?
Over the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century, the kinds of things that have been discovered by medical science are truly astonishing. The knowledge that we have of disease now, compared to the knowledge we have of disease in 1900, it's almost unrecognizable. Even the most skeptical historians of medicine will acknowledge the radical improvements in medical science and in medical practice that have taken place over the past century. And that's great. The real frustration, and one for which there's actually a great opportunity, is that we're not getting all we can out of the knowledge and the medical skills that we have. Our society, like all societies worldwide, faces a huge problem of disease, of death, of premature mortality. A lot of that could be prevented by making better use of what we already know how to do. So as important as it is to continue the course of medical research, to push the frontier of medical knowledge, we need equally enthusiastic efforts at a much more mundane problem, the problem of delivery, and the problem of behavior change, that will allow us to take full advantage of the fruits of all the progress that we've made over the past century. If we fully implemented everything that we know now, regardless of what we discover in the future, if we just used what we know now, the world could be a much healthier and longer lived place. <music>